and it looks like we can go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon. This is Transportation Committee Chair Deb Barber. It's Monday, February 28th, 2022. Before I call the meeting to order, I'd like to say a few things about how we will conduct this meeting. I want to acknowledge that COVID-19 is is causing us to alter our usual procedures due to the ongoing pandemic. Council Chair Zelli has determined that it's not reasonable or prudent to conduct in-person meetings at this time. Accordingly, Met Council members will participate in this meeting by phone or other electronic means, and this Transportation Committee meeting will be conducted under Minnesota Statute Section 13D.021. Because we are conducting the meeting electronically, all votes must be taken by roll call. Before we start the meeting, we need to establish whether there, there is a quorum. With that, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Barber? Here. Cummings? Here. Chambliss? Fredson? Here. Gonzalez? Here. Sterner? And Zirin? Zirin's present. Having a quorum present, I'll call to order the meeting of the Metropolitan Council Transportation Committee meeting for February 28, 2022. Uh, now, our first order of business is approval of the agenda. If there are no changes or additions to the agenda, we can move on to the minutes. All right, seeing none, we can move on to the minutes. So did anyone have changes or additions to the minutes uh, for the February 14, 2022 meeting? Right. Seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes from February 14, 2022. Cummings moves approval. It's moved by Cummings. Is there? For a second. second. By Fredson, is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Cummings? Aye. Chambliss? Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Sterner? Zirin? Aye. And Barber? Aye. With that, the minutes are approved. Our next order of business is employee recognition from Metro Transit. And I believe we were to have Leslie Kenderis here for that. Thank you, Chair Barber, committee members. And actually, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Funk, our Chief Operating Officer and uh, Deputy General Manager. He has all the details about the fantastic dispatchers we're acknowledging today. Perfect, thank you, Leslie. Welcome, Brian. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, I am. All right. So I think Greg has a few slides that he's going to display. Um, but uh, good afternoon again. My name is Brian Funk. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Metro Transit. Uh, today, it's my honor to introduce our February 2022 Awarding Accomplishment recipients at Metro Transit. Uh, we're celebrating the determination and hard work of our bus dispatch employees and one assistant manager in our transit control center. Uh, these employees being recognized today have served honorably throughout the pandemic, but really demonstrated exceptional work during the Omicron variant spike during the months of December and January. Uh, I know from experience how valuable this group of employees is to the success of our organization, and it's an honor to thank and recognize them today. Uh, we have some pictures of just a few members of the team who have held us together uh, and have served admirably. Next slide. Uh, dispatchers across our five bus garages are the 24-7 primary point of contact for our operators. They're responsible for ensuring that the operators are ready for service. Next slide. And as you can see, uh, they welcome employees with a smile day and night. Next slide. Seemingly overnight, our case count jumped to levels we had not experienced in any other time in the pandemic, which stressed uh, the agency's resiliency to the max. Next slide. And this resulted in many more bus operators unable to work as they recovered, took care of family members, leaving our bus service vulnerable to unplanned missed service for our customers. I'm happy to report the team didn't break and focused on how they could recruit more operators and how to minimize impacts with the resources they had. Next slide. In addition, uh, many of them also drive buses when they're not dispatching and stepped up to work incredibly long days over and over again. Next slide. They each work to assemble a complicated puzzle matching available operators to unassigned work day after day uh, when resources were more scarce than ever before. Next slide. And beyond that, they have a team approach across all garages are in constant communication with our transit control center who oversee the entire operation and communicate those changes to our customers. 
Next slide. And finally, uh, to represent the women and men of the TCC is Jim Chisholm. Uh, he's the one on the left, in case you're wondering. Uh, he works day in and day out with the dispatchers and his team to track updates, ensure that we're putting service together uh, where it's most needed. Some days, uh, it no doubt, felt like an uphill battle, but Jim's motto of it's a great day in transit, along with his perspective of learning from challenges, uh, helped the entire agency get through one of the most challenging times in the pandemic. And so with that, Madam Chair, on behalf of all Metro Transit employees and customers, it's an honor to thank our awarding accomplishment winners tonight uh, for their dedicated, unwavering service to the agency and to our customers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Yes, we would love to give real life in-person applause, but we definitely want to thank everybody. Uh, we know how hard um, all of our staff has worked throughout all of this, and this is just another great example of how um, people at Metro Transit and, and our great dispatchers, um, how they've been able to step up at the right time when we really needed them. And just uh, please convey to them that we're so proud of the work they do and thank them for really going the extra mile when we really needed some extra help. So um, uh, thank you so much. And I'm so happy we got to do this. That just puts a smile on my face. And so uh, it's, it's nice to have good stories in tough times. So thank you very much. Awesome. Um, next, we're on to our next order of business is our tab report. So we have Peter Dugan here to present. Welcome, Peter. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair. I, I understand uh, Vice Chair uh, Chambliss is not with us. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable Council Members, Director Carlson, and uh, Chief of Staff Kanderis, uh, Deputy GM Funk, and of course, Jenna and Greg for all they do behind the scenes. Uh, I'll do this briefly uh, for MnDOT. Uh, the MnDOT has noticed the start of a downward trend in fatalities in 2022. They are also sponsoring a what they call TZD, Towards Zero Death Regional Workshops. The first one is April 27th. From the MPCA, we are in year five of the 10-year VW settlement of $47 million, which as you know, is going to electric vehicle charging, uh, converting school buses to electric and the like. In the MAC report, um, good news, the MAC, I'm sorry, the Metropolitan Airports Commission, uh, Contracts have, been, uh, contracts have been made with 75 to 85 percent of the workers, uh, including the important snow plowing and engineers, and the maintenance contract is, is coming next. Uh, COVID testing now is by appointment only, uh, and they are, because of COVID, they're 300, mi I'm sorry, 300 million behind in, in uh, capital expenditures, and they're prioritizing uh, several right now. Uh, one is replacing the trams, which are at the end of their useful life. And in good news, passenger traffic and flights are up. From the TAB Executive Committee, um, Jim Hovland, the Mayor of Edina, is still, it will be the continuous chair. The Vice Chair is Debbie Gattel, the Hennepin, uh, Hennepin County Commissioner. And the second Vice Chair is Mayor Mark Winshettle of Chaska. Uh, from the Executive Committee, they have brought up three um, items that will be uh, talked about more and then uh, Chair Barber can also uh, jump in on this. One will be climate change, the other is transit rebuilding and restoring and emphasizing uh, the suburban transit, not emphasizing, but certainly including the Suburban Transit Association members of the MVTA, Southwest, Plymouth and Maple Grove. And then in funding, the last, the third element is better distribution of funds across the metro area uh, particularly uh, what was it was asked to be uh, uh, focused some not not focused but certainly some priority given to the suburban areas that are experiencing high growth the the first item um you if you on your consent agenda item number one is and program your extension and if you don't mind with the leave of the chair i thought i'd just give a very brief overview of what the program your extension is thank you madam chair uh, each regional, each regional solicitation project is supposed to be ready to go in a year it's authorized. If that can't happen for whatever reason, the sponsor can apply for a one-time, one-year program extension. However, this there's a couple of contingency. One, it's not guaranteed that the federal funding will be there when they come back online. And two, they must... Uh, they must be responsible for all for the funding of that project until federal funding becomes available. And 
because it's a delay, the excluded is any inflationary costs. Um, and the other two items uh, brought up on the uh, at the tab in information will one will be presented in the non consent uh, number four, the TPP public comment. Uh, Steve Peterson will do that. And then uh, we also had the Twin Cities mobility report, which was presented to you in October. And uh, I think you may recall Steve Peterson is the uh, high process and highway planning manager and also multi, uh, co Hineker, the multimodal planning, planning manager. In the comments, this uh, uh, generated a lot of discussion and first and foremost from our chair uh, who noted the importance of additional information to inform where investment should take place and and also the importance of a regional balance. It was concerned address that you know, why is money being spent on mobility, primarily roadways versus other methods, other modes of transportation. And so Chair Barber addressed that. Uh, several other comments were made, some rather strenuously. Um, assumption, uh, the, what is it, what is the change going to be in commuting, uh, co sorry, commuting patterns? Uh, what is the impact of the growing population? Uh, I believe it's 800,000 by 2050. Uh, then there was a, then there was a, the, also the concern that will investments reduce, will they really reduce con uh, consumption and delays? Um, again, the outer, outer suburbs asked for, for consideration. And an interesting comment was made that there's in land use, there's, there's no disincentive, there's no disincentive, disincentive to expanding. So the only, uh, the only check on it is congestion control, which is congestion. Uh, the, the other item that was brought up is car, Carters of Commerce. Uh, the presenter was the, is the director of capital planning and program and administrator for uh, Carters of Commerce. They noted in their study that two main issues came up with the number of projects and the regional balance. Uh, henceforth, uh, there only be 10 projects um, considered in 2017, as an example, there were 173 projects submitted and only four were picked. And they, the staff time that was used uh, was obviously considerable. Uh, TAB will be vetting the, uh, the, under the current proposal, TAB will be vetting the projects in the metro area, uh, the metro district. And then on regional balance of 50%, it's being proposed 50% will go towards the eight counties within MnDOT's Metro District and 50% for the outstate project. Uh, and then in a question from a TAB member, MnDOT is proposing that language uh, goes into the statute or the statute is changed to allow for screening of projects. Right now, that is not the case. And uh, Scott County announced that it will oppose the TAB vetting of MnDOT projects, thinking MnDOT should, should retain that responsibility. The last item was the, I believe it's Krissa, uh, the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriation Act. And again, the Metro District is determining how the discretionary funds will be spent from that act. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any questions? Hey, thank okay. you, Mr. Degan. Appreciate it, Peter. Um, as you can tell, it was quite a lively tab meeting. There was a lot discussed. So <laughs> if you want to hear some of the dialogue, it's definitely maybe worth the time to go back and listen to some of the conversations because it was, um, I think it was interesting throughout. I mean, you can see that it's yes. a very wide ranging group of people um, from with different perspectives, which I think is a good thing overall. Um, did anyone have any questions for Peter? Thank you. And our, our chair was uh, her usual reasonable, comp comp complimentary, you know, our chair really handled herself among us somewhat contentious uh, comments, always kept in mind regional balance, you know, we're, we're in it for everybody. All right. Thank you for my comment. Thank you for allowing my comment commentary, Madam Chair. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate it. Um, all right. We're on to other reports. So the first is uh, MTS uh, Director Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as I mentioned in the last meeting, as an upcoming item, the 2022 regional solicitation opened on February 22nd. So applications are uh, available to put in the web grant system and they'll be due by April 14th. A number of training sessions are scheduled to help applicants uh, through the process. So we're very excited for that. 
On the finance side, the state's economic forecast was released today, and Minnesota management and budget projects a surplus of $9.3 billion, which is an increase of $1.5 billion from the November forecast. So we watch this closely for the motor vehicle sales tax, or MVEST revenues, which, as you know, are a significant source of transit funds. In the new forecast, MVEST does not change significantly. It's cumulatively within about 1% of the November forecast over the four forecasted fiscal years. So no big change. It had jumped up in November uh, quite a bit, but it's it's something that often is volatile over time as well. So uh, no big change in the February forecast is my report to you today. And then uh, even though mild temps almost make it uh, forgotten, there were some pretty big snow events in the last week and uh, a lot of appreciation for our contracted services drivers helping customers through the snow events. Um, services like Metro Mobility require additional care both on board and off board. And we appreciate our, our drivers' dedication to safety and our customers' understanding when snow events do delay travel across the system. So happy for that and for uh, milder temperatures melting some of the snow and ice uh, that folks encounter in their, in their commutes. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Charles. Are there any questions? Councilmember Fretzen. Thank you, Chair uh, and Director. So can you uh, remind me, I think it was in transportation of uh, relatively recently where we discussed MVS being down. Um, so when you say no change from the Fe November forecast, does that mean that we're still down or, or are we back on close to back on track? Uh, yeah, thanks, Council Member um, Chair Barber. The uh, really, it's the difference between the forecast and the receipts. So I've reported in the past kind of on receipts, sort of the month-to-month -month, uh, receipts. This is really the four-year forecast. So although receipts can vary, you know, in, in general over time, they uh, they tend to even out, but then the forecasts often change as well. So the, the new information today is the forecast. I have not seen a uh, any receipts yet for February, but we'll report on that in the future. Great, thanks. Additional questions or comments? All right. We'll pass our thanks on to all of our people who help with these snow events because it is a big deal and still important for people to be able to get around. So thank you for mentioning that in your comments. Um, now so to it over to um, uh, Metro Transit. And um, in place of West tonight, we have Chief of Staff Leslie Kanderis presenting. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Barber committee members. Good afternoon. As Char Barber mentioned, I'm Leslie Kinderis, Chief of Staff, filling in for General Manager Koistra today. Uh, as you know, the General Manager usually starts out his updates with our latest COVID information, and I am going to get to that in a moment, but I first wanted to start out with some good gold line news. Um, as you're familiar with the gold line, it is a planned 10 mile long bus rapid transit line running in primarily bus only lanes that will connect St. Paul, Maplewood, Landfill, Landfall, excuse me, Oakdale and Woodbury to the growing metro system. And today the gold line project achieved the significant milestone of formally requesting the full funding grant agreement or FFGA from the Federal Transit Administration. And just to give you a taste of the volume of work behind this accomplishment, over 959 individual items are required as part of the FFGA application to demonstrate the project's readiness for construction. Among those items is the civil construction plans, which alone are over 4,000 sheets. Another key requirement by the FDA is the demonstration of local funding commitments. That requirement was achieved earlier this month when the county boards of Ramsey County and Washington County passed funding resolutions for about half the total cost of the project. The project has benefited from a strong partnership between the Metropolitan Council and Metro Transit, the two counties, and MnDOT since the Met Council became the lead agency back in 2017, and the project entered FTA's Capital Investment Grant Program in 2018. The cities have also been engaged throughout the design, both in shaping project decisions that best serve the communities, but also in coordination with the local station area planning. So the next step is the FTA will review the application over the next several months and prepare the grant materials for federal approvals anticipated later this year. 
And while the Met Council and its goal line partners await the FFGA, the project team will continue to prepare for construction with advertising the civil construction contract for bids in March. So congratulations to the gold line team on formally requesting the FFGA today. It's truly an impressive milestone. Um, and I'll just note that Chris Beckwith is on the line. So if there are any questions about this, um, our project director is on hand to answer them. Um, just a couple other updates. Uh, our usual COVID update, uh, since you last met on February 14th, we've had 17 COVID cases reported among our employees. And this is in pretty stark contrast to where we were in January, where we had more than 330 cases recorded that month. So we're on track to end this month with about a 10%, about 10 of the caseload we had last month. And as you've likely heard um, as well, last Friday, the CDC announced new mask guidance based on community spread and hospitalization factors. And Minnesota Department of Health and the Met Council are reviewing this guidance. Uh, and we expect to make our own adjustments, but at this moment, we continue to have a mask requirement inside all of our work locations. I'll also note that the federal mask requirement for transit uh, for all persons on buses, trains, airplanes, public transit generally, uh, remains in effect and currently is set to expire on March 18th. Um, I also wanted to provide a brief update on uh, Metro Transit Micro. Metro Transit Micro is Metro Transit's micro transit pilot project. Uh, Metro Transit is preparing to launch the pilot this summer in North Minneapolis for a one year demonstration period. And just for some context, micro transit is software based on demand ride, uh, shared ride requested through an app over the phone. Um, and the reason we wanted to mention this today is when we last update you, updated you on the micro transit pilot project in 2021 we were eyeing a, a launch date in april of this year however we are pushing out that timeline to this summer uh, largely due to the operator shortage concerns uh, facing uh, the contracted providers um, the council is currently in negotiations with a preferred software vendor after the rfp closed late 2021 and um, MTS is a partner in this project uh, right alongside Metro Transit and MTS staff are working on an operations RFP that will be out um, in quarter one of this year. So again, wanted to just make sure this uh, change in timeline was on your radar, um, in part because our staff are out connecting with community stakeholders, sharing information about the project, and we wanted to make sure you had the, the latest information too. Uh, and finally, uh, tomorrow is March already, and we are planning for the annual Transit Driver Appreciation Day celebrations. This year, Transit Driver Appreciation Day is on March 18th. Uh, and to thank and celebrate our operators on March 18th, we'll be serving breakfast and lunch at each of our garages and light rail facilities, and we'll be greeting drivers in downtown Minneapolis, downtown St. Paul, and the Mall of America. So you're going to be receiving more information from us via email. Um, and we'll get that to you by this Friday, March 4th, uh, and that will include more of the details about how you can participate in, in really thanking our operators for their amazing work each day. So with that, uh, Chair Barber, I am complete and happy to take any questions. Very good. Thank you, Leslie. Are there any questions for Ms. Kinderis? Councilmember Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Not really a question, really a comment. Um, having been involved in the Green Line extension, um, both um, when I was on the council, then as mayor, and now on the on the uh, Met Council, the submitting the FFGA is just absolutely monumental and huge, and a team effort and an incredible amount of work. And so, getting there is um, really 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 a big step so congratulations it's very exciting to hear that you're at that point it's just wonderful and hopefully things will go smoothly as as uh we progress through the process but thanks for all that work absolutely additional questions or comments all right then i'm just going to echo that uh congratulations chris and goldline team that's it's very very good news um it's nice to have good news on a monday you said we like I said, even with the, the employee appreciation, we're needing it more and more. So it's nice to have something like that to celebrate. But thank you for all your hard work and, and to all of your team for all the efforts. Um, and then um, also, Leslie, thanks for sharing the information on Transit um, Driver Appreciation Day. I'm excited that 
Um, it sounds like we'll be able to have a more active role this year, and um, it's one of my favorite days to um, get out and engage with our, our operators and people at gar garages and, and um, have that sort of actually direct connection. So I'm looking forward to hearing what we have planned. So thank you. All right. Um, with reports done, we can move on to business. Our first item of business is our consent items. There are two items on consent. Um, I'd entertain a motion to approve the items on consent. Fredson, I'll move approval. It's moved by Fredson. Is there a second? Cummings seconds. Seconded by Cummings. Is there any other discussion? It's seen and hearing none. Jenna, could you call the roll? Cummings. Aye. Chambliss, Fredson, aye. Gonzalez, aye. Sterner, aye. Zirin, aye. And Barber, aye. With that, the consent agenda is passed. On to our first business item. We have business item number 2022-46, which is the release of the E-Line recommended corridor plan for public comment. And we have Kyle O'Donnell Burroughs here to present. I believe you're on mute. I can kind of hear you, but I think I'm still, but I'm still having trouble hearing you. Don't worry, I had troubles when we started too. <laughs> okay, how's this, everybody? Now I can hear you. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Barber, committee members. Um, uh, my name is Kyle Donald Burroughs, and I am a senior planner with the Metro Transit Arterial BRT programs, uh, and I'm leading planning efforts on the uh, Metro E Line project. Um, go ahead, next slide, please. Um, our proposed uh, action uh, this afternoon is item 2022-46, which requests that the council authorize the release of the Metro E-Line recommended corridor plan uh, for public review and comment, um, and direct staff to collect public comments through Friday, April 8th, summarize those comments, and report the findings to the Metropolitan Council. Uh, next slide. Um, first, uh, I wanted to do a quick overview of where we are in the E-Line planning process. Um, you'll recall that the, that the Metropolitan Council approved the E-Line alignment in January of 2020 uh, based on the results of the E-Line corridor study, which ran through 2018 and 2019 and looked at a number of different uh, E-Line uh, e alignment options, uh, analyzed them based on a number of different factors and included a robust uh, public engagement process. Following the council approvement of the alignment, uh, work began in earnest on the development of the E-Line corridor plan, which defines the station and platform locations along the alignment. Um, the recommended corridor plan, which is the subject of today's item, is the second of three versions of that corridor plan. A draft plan was released in September for public review and comment, and the comment period ran from September 20th through October 31st. Um, the purpose of the recommended corridor plan is to really uh, report back on, to the public um, a summary of what was heard during the uh, comment period on the draft plan, as well as kind of some of the key themes and providing some context and responses to those, to those themes, share changes and revisions made to the draft plan, made to the plan um, based on feedback on the draft plan. And it provides that ongoing opportunity for public comment um, on the plan itself as we continue to move through the corridor plan development process. Um, that'll wrap up ahead of um, or that, that public feedback will then lead into a final corridor plan, um, which will be brought to the Council later this spring, uh, anticipated for May 2022. Um, following the approval of the final corridor plan, uh, the project will begin detailed engineering at station and platform locations through 
um, in the fall of 2022 through 2023 and begin construction in 2024 uh, through 2025. Uh, next slide, please. So the primary purpose of the corridor plan is to define the intersections where E-line stations will be located and within those uh, intersections define the platform locations at each of those stations. So essentially defining which corner of each intersection uh, the E-line stations will be built. Uh, council action to, appro to approve the final corridor plan uh, later this spring will then set those platform locations uh, at the intersection level and allow staff to move into the design and engineering phase of the project. Um, other items included in the corridor plan for sort of additional information and context um, include concept bus service plans for uh, both the E-Line itself as well as uh, the future Route 6, which will have some, is proposed to have some changes uh, to it when the E-Line uh, begins operation uh, running along uh, Xerxes Avenue primarily into downtown Minneapolis. Um, it will also include some priorities for bus priority treatments and bus only lanes along the E-Line corridor. Um, that'll help us help the, the project meet its uh, speed and reliability goals. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, so, as I noted previously, a draft version of the uh, corridor plan was released in September of last year. Um, we had a pretty uh, robust communications outreach and engagement activities uh, in support of that, uh, of the release of that draft plan um, running through the end of October. Um, and throughout that process, we collected uh, 561 individual responses on the draft corridor plan during that time. Um, along with some in-person engagement um, and meetings with, with uh, the key, stake, key stakeholders at key st station locations along the corridor, where we received feedback there as well. You can see in the map on this slide that, uh, which, uh, which shows survey respondents by zip code, um, that the majority of survey respondents have a home zip code, you know, broadly defined within the corridor area um, with the highest concentration of respondents coming from South and Southwest Minneapolis. Um, most of the survey respondents who completed demographic information, uh, which we included as optional in the survey response, um, identified as, as white, uh, and survey respondents have higher than average household incomes with about 55% um, of respondents having household incomes of over $100,000. Uh, the age of respondents is relatively well distributed across a, a wide range of, of age groups. Next slide, please. Um, so this side just at a high level reviews both kind of the distribution of comments we received on individual station locations um, and a quick summary of some of the overall key themes that we heard uh, on the corridor plan. So I'll take us through these um, uh, just quickly here. So looking at this chart first, showing the comments received on individual station locations. This chart shows station locations receiving 10 or more comments uh, in the draft plan engagement process. So um, really stations having, you know, a, a sort of notable number of comments throughout that process. Uh, the orange bar indicates comments that were, um, you know, broadly either opposed to the station location or requested state or requested changes at that at that location, and the green bar indicates comments that um, supported the station as shown in the draft corridor plan. Uh, you can see the the standout station location here was at uh, Upton and Forty Third Street in Linden Hills, which generated kind of the the most significant amount of, of feedback we received on any individual station locations on the plan. Um, received about 197 comments on this location. And they're uh, fairly evenly split between supporting the plan um, and opposing or requesting changes at this location. Uh, the next highest uh, common count was at uh, France and 50th Street, uh, and then uh, sort of tapers down, down from there. Um, in addition to comments received on the survey, of course, we've also had some direct communications and meetings with um, nearby residents or business owners uh, at several station locations on request, 
uh, and continue to meet with station neighbors to address their concerns and feedback um, throughout this process, including at Upton and 43rd and at France at 50th Street. <clears throat> so sliding over to the, the right half of, the, of this slide, looking at uh, some of the highlights on key overall themes, um, I'll quickly um, provide a quick summary of, of these themes and, and how they're uh, addressed in the recommended corridor plan. Um, in the comment summary, the feedback summary section of that plan, we provide um, quite a bit of additional information in support of sort of the Metro Transit response to comments related to these themes. And I'll just kind of hit the highlights of that here. Um, so the first overall theme we saw was really strong support for transit access to key destinations, um, both um, in support of access to retail nodes, as well as destinations like uh, medical services, schools, that type of thing. Uh, we're really glad to see that because that is a key driver of station location uh, decision making, as well as the overall alignment of the E-Line, providing access to those destinations. Um, we also received quite a bit of support for bus priority treatments, uh, and in particular, bus only lanes, um, both on the Hennepin Avenue um, in South Minneapolis, but also on other key segments. Um, and so in response to that, we have really expanded our analysis of bus priority treatments, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and identified our priorities for bus only lane segments along the E-Line corridor uh, and added uh, additional information about that in the recommended uh, corridor plan. We received some concerns about the scale of BRT stations and sort of the general impact on neighborhood character. And want to note there that, you know, most of the stations uh, planned, uh, most of the stations, E-Line stations are planned to use shelters that are uh, approximately the same size as local shelters that are along the corridor today. And we really designed these shelters in a way uh, for a consistency, uh, both to ensure ease of maintenance and a consistent customer experience. Um, during the design process, so following the planning process here, we'll be certainly working to with station uh, neighbors and um, being sure to identify specific placement locations to minimize the effects on the public realm. Um, we also received some concerns about on-street parking impacts. So uh, looking at station locations that will remove on-street parking, um, you know, the total loss here when you zoom out from the particular block to, um, you know, what is available nearby is actually is very small, looking at about 1% to 2% in key locations of on-street parking locations that are potentially removed within a two to three minute walk or roll. Um, and so, you know, we feel, you know, uh, that's a trade-off um, that uh, supports, um, you know, goals and priorities of the E-Line uh, corridor project, as well as broader goals within our agency part partners. Uh, we received some concerns about the removal of boulevard trees at station locations. Um, and of course, trees are providing significant benefits um, both, you know, just to the neighborhood and environmentally, as well as for transit riders, um, including shade at stations. And we certainly seek to minimize impacts of trees where possible. And we'll be documenting um, any trees that will be impacted through a tree impact survey and memo. Um, where possible, will the platform design will incorporate those mature trees uh, to avoid removal altogether or damage. Uh, and where this can't be avoided, we'll look to uh, working with our cities and, and park board partners on relocation or on-site replacement options. And we also received a lot of um, comments in support of integrating protected bicycle facilities at the platform locations. Uh, and we're certainly pursuing that, um, coordinating with our partner agencies along the corridor to not preclude implementation of, of any bikeways in adopted plans and policies. Um, and a number of E-Line stations included in um, coordinated projects uh, constructed by um, our local partners um, are coordinated right now that will have a uh, bikeway platform behind, behind the platform. Um, next slide, please. 
And so based on that feedback and overall feedback we received on the draft plan, we are making several revisions that will be included in the recommended corridor plan. Um, we are recommending um, platform location changes at three station locations. So those are highlighted in green on the map here. First is at University in Barrie, which is the northern terminal of the line. Um, it is a transfer opportunity to the Westgate station on the Metro Green Line. We're shifting that northbound platform onto Berry Street proper from University Avenue, and that will um, better connect with the local service there, uh, as well as facilitate transfers at the West at the Westgate station. Um, Upton and 43rd Street is another shift. Um, we are making shifting from the southbound location from the near from the far side to the near side um, in order to uh, both uh, preserve um, uh, overall um, e-line goals and objectives as well as respond to some of the concerns we received from station neighbors at this location uh, around impacts to trees and potential parking um, reduction there uh, and then at 44th and Zenith Zenith we are recommending to shift that station location one block, excuse me, to the west, uh, to Abbott Avenue, uh, to better serve increased residential development, new residential development there at Abbott Avenue, um, and be closer to the commercial node at Beer Street while maintaining adequate station spacing between neighboring station locations. We also performed additional analysis of platform alternatives at several other station locations uh, listed there and shown in orange on the map. Um, but are not recommending any changes to from the draft plan to uh, in the recommended plan. And then as alluded to on the previous slide, we have uh, fairly robust additional context and responses to the overall key themes we received um, on the draft corridor plan, uh, including potentially uh, including identifying issues to address throughout the engineering phase of the project. And then finally, as noted earlier, um, adding an expanded discussion of our priorities for bus only lanes and other bus priority treatments in the recommended core. Uh, next slide, please. So pending action from the council on March 9th, we are planning our uh, public engagement period to begin on March 9th and run through April 8th. Um, we'll be focusing on reaching uh, station neighbors, future E-Line station neighbors, um, through doing direct outreach at station locations, including door knocking, um, getting on um, getting on buses at key bus stop locations, and partnering with community organizations and neighborhood groups, as well as a broader corridor-wide engagement effort, um, hosting the project website with key information, a direct mailing throughout the entire corridor, um, increasing awareness about the project and opportunity to comment, uh, and then a variety of, of electronic communication tools as well as fact sheets available in, in uh, Spanish, Somali, uh, and Mom. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so concluding um, item 2022-46, request the council authorize the release of the E-Line recommended corridor plan for public review and comment and direct staff to collect public comments um, through Friday, April 8th, summarize those comments and report the findings to the Metropolitan Council. And with that, Chair Barber, I will conclude and uh, stand for any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions um, from council members? Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I know that it, you received so much feedback already, and that is great. And I think it's indicative of how much interest and uh, there is and how challenging planning this project can be, or any project, but we're talking about this one at this point, um, to really continue. I'm really, really pleased to hear about all the opportunities to engage stakeholders and to 
engage our businesses, the people who ride transit, um, everyone as much as we can. I know that you've already made some adjustments based on what you've already heard. And I, I much of this runs through my district and um, I know that I get a lot of feedback on this, so I can only imagine what you're getting, but um, it's really, really critical that we listen to all the voices and make sure that we are doing the best for the most as much as possible. There are always going to be challenges in something like this, but um, I appreciate the work that you're doing and I look forward to being engaged uh, in my district as this unfolds and, and meetings happen and so forth. So um, to you, I would say anytime there's something where I can be a presence and uh, help articulate the vision and, uh, and get additional input from the groups that you're meeting with, please don't hesitate to call on me. And um, again, I thank you for all of the outreach. I think it's just so, so important that we do that. And I'm glad to see such a robust program for engaging so many on so many different levels. So thank you. It'll be interesting to watch this unfold and, and I'll be very curious to see uh, at the end of the public comment period how things shake out and, and where if there are adjustments that have been made, but thank you. Thank you, council members. Any additional questions or comments from council members? Council member Fredson. Fredson, thanks chair. I, I would just say my assumption is the concerns about the scale of the stations are in response to say the, the larger stations like the Lake Street station and others. Is that is that right? And um, my I would also assume there's no plans to have a, a large scale station along this route, right? Uh, Chair Barber, committee members, um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think many of the concerns about, um, you know, the, the scale of the stations um, come from, um, you know, parts of the uh, kind of on the southern end of, of the corridor, so we're sort of outside of, um, you know, in kind of the areas that are, um, you know, maybe more residential or kind of a smaller business nodes. And uh, you're correct that in, in those locations, um, we are uh, planning the uh, the smallest kind of BRT BRT style shelter, um, you know, to sort of fit well within within that overall context. And you know, these shelters are approximately the same size as existing local shelters that are out in many of the stops along these locations today. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. thank you. I would just comment, you know, as far as my experience is they're they're relatively small footprint and they get the job done. So that's why I asked for the clarification about the, the concerns. I assumed it was the larger stations. Thanks. All right. Any additional questions or comments? All right. Seeing and hearing none, uh, entertain a motion to approve business item 2022-46. Cummings moves approval. It's moved by Cummings. Is there a second? Sterner seconds. Seconded by Sterner. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none. Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Cummings. Cummings. Aye. Chambliss. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. And Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you very much, Kyle. Next, we're on to business item number 2022-48, which is the Gold Line Administrative Settlement on Parcel 416. And I believe we have Robin Kaufman here to present. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon, committee members. I'm. Uh, my name is Robin Kaufman, and I am the Director of Administration for the Capital Projects. And I'm here today to present a real estate activity as, um, as Chief of Staff Kanderas mentioned, uh, the Gold Line has been making a lot of progress and um, moving towards construction and uh, the property acquisition process is, is another one of those steps. Uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview, um, this request is uh, going to be um, asking the council to, to authorize a settlement for one of our larger parcels. And so the parcel that we're looking at is parcel 416, which is uh, also titled Wood Lane Drive. Uh, it, uh, we, are, we are acquiring uh, roughly 5.5 acres of a larger 8.7 acre parcel. Uh, you can see on the north side, we're uh, acquiring the northern um, portion of this parcel uh, that is uh, kind of severed by Woodland Drive, Wood Lane Drive. And so we're acquiring that northern part that's kind of a peach with some hashing over it. And the, the uh, purpose for the acquisition is for a 512 stall park and ride at the Woodland Wood Lane Drive Station Park and Ride. So it's the, uh, the easternmost uh, terminus station for the gold line. Next slide, please. And, oh. Back one, there we go. And just um, to to give a little bit of a graphical representation, so you can can picture this. Uh, the um, this is the Woodlane Drive Station Park and Ride. Again, it's a ramp um, that is uh, being built on a vacant piece of property, and um, it also has the station there. So you can see on the uh, left side of the screen, you can see the 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 rendering and then on the north on the west or I'm sorry the right side you can see kind of how that park and ride in the station is laid out um, laid out on the property uh, next slide please uh, so for just a little bit of background um, we uh, made an offer on this parcel uh, some time ago um, the initial offer was uh, 3.1 million dollars uh, and um, and since then, that was based on an overall uh, uh, um, cost of $14.50 per square foot. Um, the property owner did come back with the counter offer, and we have been able to negotiate negotiate down to um, 16.5, uh, negotiate down from, well, from their counter uh, up a little bit from our initial offer at an average of $16.5 square um, dollars per square foot. So that comes to a total dollar amount of uh, uh, just under $4 million. Um, council policy does require that any administrative settlements for uh, property acquisition over a million dollars does need to be approved by the council. So that's why uh, one of the reasons we're here today. And um, once we uh, go through the approval process, um, we will be working with them um, on uh, what's called a friendly condemnation process. Uh, we do have a, a settlement on the, on the amount, but um, the friendly condemnation process is how we're gonna be establishing that parcel division since we have to split it from, from that Southern portion. Next slide. So based on that, um, uh, the negotiation process and um, that this is a, a fair and reasonable, um, um, fair and reasonable Settlement for the council, um, we are asking that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute an administrative settlement on parcel 416, the Wooddale Shopping Center, in an amount, in an amount not to exceed $3,974,340 for the Metro Gold Line Bus Rapid Transit Project. With that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to take any questions. Very good, thank you. Are there any questions or comments from council members? Council member Sterner. Thank you, Chair. Um, it might be the terminology, but I'm just wondering, was this a willing seller or was it in the domain was used to uh, do it? Because we're saying settlement rather than agreement and things like that. So I just want to get better clarification on that. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Madam Member, council. Council member, um, yes, it is a, they're a willing seller. We are negotiating with them. It's the, it's the term friend, friendly condemnation that probably um, makes it sound like it's adversarial. I do have um, uh, Greg Ewig, our real estate director is on the, on the call too, if there's any specific questions about how that, how about how that process works. Okay, and then Chair and, um, and Robin, just to follow up in, so, we're basically paying fair market value for this with a negotiated amount with between the, the two on that, it, it sounds like. And we're we're purchasing the what we need and, and that kind of thing for the for the rest to do our gold line. Yes, that is okay. uh, member, that is correct. 
All right, thank you. That's all I have for complete. All right, any additional questions or comments from council members? Council member Gonzalez. Thank you, and, and just a quick comment. Um, I've been following, of course, the development of the goal line since, since I started here at the council, and it's so exciting to see the pieces falling in place after um, you know all the discussions that we had and, and the slight bumps on the road, but um, congratulations to the whole team for moving this thing forward and looking forward to taking that ride from Woodbury to St. Paul in the near future. So thank you. Thank you. Right. Any additional questions or comments? All right, then I would entertain a motion to approve business item 2022-48. And so move. Moved by Gonzalez. Is there a second? Fredson, I'll second. Seconded by Fredson. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none. Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Cummings. Aye. Chambliss. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. And Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you very much. Next, we are on to business item 2022-47, which is the 2022 Transportation Committee Work Plan. And Leslie Kinderis and Charles Carlson are here to present the item. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I can uh, certainly start things off. So uh, we had issued and discussed last time a, um, a few items from, or th this list of items that's really the information items that we expect to come before the committee across the year. And as, as mentioned last time, it's a longer list than would fit in uh, the uh, flow of meetings from week to week, but certainly one that uh, we want to make sure we, we curate both to the relevant topics of the day as well as uh, the level of interest of the council members. So um, we received just a bit of, of input on the uh, list. And so I think we'll continue to uh, draw upon these items uh, from the from the work plan as the as the year goes on. And uh, with that, Madam Chair, we'd be happy to entertain any questions. Otherwise, um, uh, I'll, I will turn it over to Leslie if there's anything further. Chair Barber, um, I think Director Carlson covered it really well. I just want to emphasize uh, what you're hearing from from him as well, that this is really a living document. We want it to be responsive. We want what we bring to you to be responsive to what's going on and to your interests. And so while we hope this is a good, um, robust menu of options that we'll be working from, it doesn't end conversation. And obviously, we're always willing to hear from you if, if there are topics of interest that you want brought forward. So thank you. Very good. Thank you to both of you. Um, questions, comments from council members? Um, I just have one quick comment, and I made it last time, but I really appreciate the work that was done uh, between Metro Transit and MTS working together to come up with a single plan um, for the committee. I think that it really shows that we're trying to be both efficient but really thorough in the work that we're doing. So um, I think it's a much better approach than we've done historically, so I really appreciate the work that was done for that. Um, so with that, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2022-47. Fredson, I'll move approval. Thank you. It's moved by Fredson. Is there a second? Coming seconds. Seconded by Cummings. Um, is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Cummings. Aye. Chambliss. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. And Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Uh, thank you, Leslie and Charles. Next, we're on to business item number 2022-60, which is the public comment report and amendment one to the 2040 transportation policy plan. And I believe we have Steve Peterson here to present. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this was an item that uh, you released for public comments um, and the public comment period is now over. It was December 9th through the, the 24th of January. And this was had two components. The first um, was to bring all the network next rec recommendations for arterial BRT into the long range plan, the transportation policy plan. And also to add 
uh, six highway freight projects funded through MnDOT's uh, Minnesota Highway Freight Program. Uh, we did receive uh, 56 um, individual comments from 40 commenters. Next slide, please. So we'll go through the uh, different topic areas kind of one by one. The first was the ABRT comments and um, a number of comments both from individuals and from um, local agencies were received. We'll, we'll come back to the one change that's being recommended based on these public comments that was from the city of Bloomington, a letter we received. And we'll come back to that in a later slide. Next slide, please. So again, six freight projects uh, spread throughout the region um, did receive uh, quite a few comments here um, related to one of those six projects, which was a, is a project in Carver County on Highway 212. Uh, rural freight and safety project and uh, corridor coalition uh, sent a number of uh, um, positive uh, letters supporting that project all the way from from uh, here in Carver County all the way out to Granite Falls so um, nice nice to see some of those um, regional if not statewide projects being supported next slide uh, like any public comment period you, you've heard of a of a couple of them here tonight. Uh, we did receive a number of comments, uh, general comments, uh, back to the council on how we're making investments in transportation and studying those. Um, while, while perhaps not pertinent to the specific projects coming in or out of the TPP, um, those are important to us and we did um, make response to each and every one of those and do consider those in, in future um, updates to the long range plan or other funding decisions that, that come before us. So next slide. Uh, so again, the one change being recommended coming out of the public comment period uh, on this TPP amendment is coming from the city of Bloomington. They requested um, to keep the American Boulevard corridor in the long range plan. So again, this was in the increased revenue scenario. So if we do get more money, this would be a corridor for future transit investment. Um, Network Next uh, proposed um, removing it from that kind of future future list. Um, the city of Bloomington wrote a letter committing to do a, a study of the corridor. And so um, because of their commitment there, uh, we're recommending that we keep American Boulevard in the increased revenue scenario as a transit way to be studied is the terminology. A few reasons for that. Uh, certainly a number of transit ways uh, come together here and or connect to American Boulevard. And they've been also making um, a lot of land, local land use decisions, including densifying the, the corridor and, and uh, other TOD investments right along the American Boulevard. So it's a corridor very important to the local uh, community and, and certainly ties into the regional system. And so uh, with their commitment to fund a study, uh, uh, we're recommending again that, that to retain it in the increased revenue scenario. Next slide. I think that uh, covers what we wanted um, today. And again, this is an action item. Um, before you, Madam Chair, and we'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Are there questions or comments from council members? Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to express my appreciation that uh, American Boulevard corridor is being retained in the increased revenue scenario based on the um, city leading a transit way study. I know that was very, very important to them. And I think that the willingness to include them in the increased revenue scenario shows that our partnership with our stakeholders, our cities, our municipalities is really, really important. And in fact, we do listen and we review and we try to find a way to make things work for the most. So thank you for that consideration. I appreciate that. Okay. All right, additional questions or comments? All right, I'll just make a quick one. Um, just wanna thank um, really um, Steve and all the staff at MTS for this sounds like such a simple business item that we're doing, but this has been months in the making and lots of studies that have informed this um, to um, provide some good um, more recent information for the transportation policy plan. So uh, really thank you to everyone who was part of this because whether it was our staff or TAB or different people that have been integral to this process, um, I mean, it's it's that kind of good data and information that helps us make good decisions in the long run. So thank you. Thanks. All right, then I will entertain a motion to approve business item 2022-60. This is Sterner. I'd make a motion to approve the item. It's moved by Sterner. Is there a second? Second by Gonzalez. Seconded by Gonzalez. Is there any other discussion? 
seeing and hearing none. Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Cummings? Aye. Chambliss? Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Zirin? Aye. And Barber? Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. So uh, now we are done with business for the evening. Um, so um, business item number three doesn't go any further than transportation committee because it's our work plan. Um, I would say business item two can go on consent to the full council, but then business item one, so the E-line and the transportation policy plan amendment could go non-consent to the full council. Do you guys agree with that? All right. Um, so that is the plan and then we will move on to our information item and we have our Metro Transit quarterly service change and operator staffing update. We have Brian Funk and Adam Harrington here to present tonight. Hi, uh, good afternoon Chair Barber again. Uh, Brian Funk, the Deputy General Manager, Chief Operating Officer and Adam Harrington and I are here today to provide you uh, both with the operator hiring status as well as our upcoming service changes. Next slide, please. So as we've uh, presented to the committee before, uh, our level of service needs to be in sync with our operator resources. And uh, as I described when uh, handing out or describing the awarding accomplishment um, earlier tonight, too few operators results in less reliable service and really strains our system. And so we're again looking at uh, where we are today, what our projections are for hiring and retention, and then uh, what we're able to do with the resources that we do have. Next slide, please. So a snapshot of where we are today, our current ideal number of full-time and part-time weekday operators is 1,148, uh, with current staffing at uh, 1,110. So uh, we remain nearly 40 operators below our uh, current ideal number. And it's primarily driven by an attrition rate that is up a little bit from prior years. Uh, but more importantly, it's driven by a hiring rate that is uh, not able currently in our tough market to keep pace uh, with that attrition. Uh, we currently have seven students who are in training and we're really excited about that. Um, but it's still a little bit below our goal of 12 students for each class if we're able to uh, not just continue to tread water, but start to rebuild and add back additional service. Next slide. Um, and speaking of reliability, as I described with the awarding accomplishments, uh, we had some challenges that were really pronounced in uh, December and January. And so uh, this chart shows the number of canceled trips on any given day, and you can see how highly variable it was uh, during the months of December and January. Uh, as you might recall, the line in the middle, our last set of service changes, uh, we did make adjustments to try and reset. You can see we had a few days of success. However, uh, that was quickly eroded and we lost ground uh, because of the Omicron variant. Uh, we've now started to stabilize, but as I mentioned before, our hiring currently and our projections are just simply not strong enough to be able to maintain that level of reliability. And so, uh, as Adam will describe later in the presentation, we're starting to make uh, some additional adjustments to uh, temporarily allow us to catch up and uh, regroup. Next slide, please. And uh, like we talked about before, uh, these shortages are not unique to Metro Transit. Um, however, I'll describe the tactics that we're using to try to overcome a really tough market for commercial drivers locally. Um, but it's something that transit agencies across the country continue to struggle with. You can see uh, uh, just a few headlines. Uh, these are repopulating day in and day out from large and small transit agencies who are experiencing these challenges and looking for uh, new ways to recruit and retain employees. Uh, we think that you know we're the best in the business and we have a great thing going, uh, but getting folks started here to be able to build a career uh, is really where our focus lies in transportation with some partnerships, of course, with human resources and workforce development. Next slide. And so to that end, uh, we kind of, we have a four prong approach focused on recruitment, retention, partnerships, and marketing. Um, on the recruitment side, as we're looking for new employees to fill those vacancies, uh, we've continued hiring uh, or having twice monthly hiring events. Uh, at our instruction center. And so we've had 16 monthly hiring events since June of 2021 uh, with more planned. 
uh, including a couple more coming up in the middle of March. Uh, we did hire 112 operators in 2021, which is great, and 59 of those new hires attended a hiring event between June and November. And uh, as it continues to, uh, we continue to learn more about our new market. Uh, the number one source for job referrals um, is our own employees. And so we're focusing on that and promoting uh, what a great career path it is and highlighting the stories of our employees and encouraging them to share that with friends and family who may be interested. On the retention front, uh, we continue our new support employee programs. We know that uh, starting any job, but in particular our transit bus operator jobs, the first few months uh, and the first couple of years are really challenging to be able to find your groove and continue to hone your skills uh, in what can be uh, a stressful job, especially at times. We've expanded our operator apprenticeship program to uh, go longer into people's careers with more touch points uh, from experienced mentors who are able to help guide our newest employees. We've also added resiliency and de-escalation training, and we have money set aside this year for additional resources for supervisory and management staff to build on that uh, and be able to best support our newest employees and all operators. Uh, we've also continued making investments in personal safety and security. And uh, as this group well knows, there's uh, work going on within the Transit Police Work Group, uh, which will benefit and instill that confidence for our operators that they're able to safely complete their job day in and day out. Uh, as it relates to partnerships, uh, primarily, you know, those partnerships internally um, have never been stronger. And so uh, we have human resources staff attending job fairs, virtual and in person. Uh, we continue to offer through our workforce development program, uh, commercial learners permit assistance three times per week, as well as application assistance for people who are looking to get started with us to make sure that they successfully give themselves credit for uh, all of their work and uh, are in a best position to receive an offer from us. We've also continued working uh, over the last couple of years, but with fresh eyes this last few months on hiring processes and areas to streamline, including an adjustment to supplemental questions, adjustment to requirements of the position as they're described in the posting, uh, more information that can be provided at the time of hire, um, as well as reducing the duration of the application to simplify it um, and streamlining the background check process. So we're able to make those offers to candidates who are interested and may have multiple offers pending as quickly as possible. And finally, on the marketing front, uh, we continue to have a strong presence in the marketplace uh, through strategic marketing, both online uh, as well as traditional methods. Um, our metrotransit.org slash drive page is a pop-up for anyone visiting our website and is a good reminder of what we're looking for in people applying for these positions um, and what we can offer candidates who are interested in driving with us. Uh, we've adjusted our strategy to focus on uh, the bus operator role becoming a place to start your career with highlighting uh, excellent benefits, paid training, and of course, the ongoing commitment to a full-time position. Uh, we've also started to work on ads and um, descriptions for folks in senior management who started their career in frontline positions, including the bus operator role. And we're supporting those hiring events with additional staff who are able to explain their experience at Metro Transit for people who are just getting started. And again, may have multiple uh, pathways available to them in a really competitive market. Uh, we are adding some guerrilla marketing strategies, more radio and TV ad placement. And I think over the coming weeks, you'll see additional splashes uh, from Metro Transit um, that we're really excited about to celebrate our current employees, uh, as well as try to reach new employees who are interested in joining our team. Uh, and then finally, we've added texting for information between um, our customer relations and TIC and human resources departments so that people have uh, everything at their fingertips when they're looking for information about the job. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adam to describe our March 2022 uh, situation and service changes. Great. Thank Great. you, Brian. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee members. So as Brian described earlier, we're about 40 operators short of our, our deal scheduled for the whole network. And we continue to notify our customers through our transit control center specialists via e-rider alert. 
we look at getting our day to day man operations managed from that location and as much as we try and they were recognized dutifully at the beginning of this meeting and we're grateful for all their work to get the work out we still have needs to be met every day and while uh, the current week that we're in we're doing okay we also know that coming up this summer we've got some requirements for additional bus operators namely and noted here is the track work between the airport and Mall of America, which will require a bus bridge. So that'll require some additional operators. We're looking forward to activities this August, which would include the state fair and hoping to increase service in August as hopefully travel patterns return to something that's a little bit more common and attractive for our commuters and throughout the network. But we know that ridership remains below the 2019 levels, even though we provide a really strong network of bus service throughout the whole region. Next slide. So this is just our chart to make sure we're thinking about what capacity we have on our vehicles. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we have high frequency service on most of our urban local corridors and throughout the region but they're not carrying the same rides that they were back in 2019. So there is capacity in our vehicles to accommodate more customers. Next slide. And we also know that the travel patterns have changed significantly as anyone who works in an office environment, that commute pattern where people are actually traveling outside of their home has changed significantly in the last two years. And this chart represents uh, the difference in travel behavior for transit. When you look at the large black line on here, this is the 2019 pre-COVID ridership pattern throughout the day, a high AM rush hour and a high PM rush hour, and our service was built around that. Well, that's significantly flattened and we have much more of our activity and all day type service so we wanna make sure that we continue to provide that and we're doing a little bit of a balancing act to make sure that our customers have the service that we schedule. Next slide. Our plan for improving our reliability and ensuring our reliability moving forward as we potentially could have additional attrition and maybe not being able to keep up to where we wanna be on March 26th, we're reducing the operator requirement by about 45 full-time bus operators in our scheduled service. So thinking back to that chart, the table that Brian showed where we are below our ideal scheduled number down to about 1110. Uh, so we're trying to meet that requirement for what we have. The reductions that we're scheduling for March 26th are a little bit different than our approach last December we're really looking at managing the bus capacity and making sure that we can provide good seat capacity. We don't want to have route suspensions, but we have a do have a couple branch suspensions that are in the works on Route 6 on Wooddale, Route 75D Parkview, and the Route 114C, which is a University of Minnesota trip um, that will be suspended. So we're looking to minimize the ridership impact. Most of our customers have alternate service. And when you think about the change, the scale of change that we're making, when we're talking about going from a route that runs every 10 minutes to every maybe every 12 minutes or every 15 minutes, it's still really good frequency, um, but it may not be as convenient as our customers have experienced over the past. So we're stepping down frequencies to match the demand there. I'll also mention that We'll be getting information out more broadly to our customers later this week in our Connect newsletter online. And we'll be providing our schedules online next week on March 7th. And then ultimately our printed materials will show up about two weeks before the March 26th implementation date. So uh, again, our goal is to make sure we've got reliable service. We're continuing to watch those numbers and make sure we can deliver our service all the while balancing that against what we're anticipating for additional service needs for bus operations this summer, this fall. And of course, with D-Line coming on uh, online in December this coming year. So we're excited about that. We wanna make sure we start on the best foot. And with that, I think it's the next slide and we can close out. Any questions for Brian or I? Thank you, Brian. And um, questions from council members. Councilmember Cummings. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Really more of a comment um, or a couple of comments. Um, thank you, Adam and Brian, that's a great report. Uh, really important to keep up to date on the changes that you're having to make. Uh, it must be incredibly difficult without having that um, crystal ball that tells you what's gonna happen uh, in an hour, much less what's gonna happen in the next couple of months. So thank you for all the work that you do. Um, I, I know how hard you're working. I think, you know, earlier in the meeting when we had the acknowledgement and celebration of some of our operators and staff in dispatch and so forth, I think that's really, really, really important that we continue to do that as often as we can. Um, I think it's important and I hope that you can relay from the council how much we appreciate all of the work that our operators are doing that dispatch does that bring it all together so that it can function as well as it does. Um, these are It's certainly a stressful job and these are stressful times. And, um, and, and by the same token, it's a wonderful career and it's a wonderful career opportunity. And I appreciate you putting it out a lot. I know that many of us are sharing it through our own social networks. And um, and so thank you for that. But uh, it's, it's I, I just think it's a really important if you can let, you know, I think sometimes people think that they are working, they're sort of under the radar and they're, you know, what do we, what are we aware of and do we recognize how stressful it is? And I hope that you will relay that in fact we do. And in fact, we really appreciate and support and are grateful for all of the effort that keeps the system going as well as it, it has and as well as it's going to, and hopefully everything um, will bounce back here in the upcoming months and, and we'll move forward on a more positive vein. But, vein, but thank you for the report. Um, it was It's very interesting and I think really important to keep up with all the changes. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. I don't think I could have said it any better myself. So thank you very much for, for all of that. Um, any other questions or comments from Council Members? Well, Brian and Adam, I really appreciate you um, keep coming back to us because I think we're going to be very curious to see what happens, um, especially over the next few months. I'm really curious to see even how, what changes happen between now and June. Um, it's definitely, you know, I get asked the question a lot. And um, so this having the information um, like on a quarterly basis like this has been very, very helpful for me. So, um, so thank you. All right. Uh, Anything else from council members this evening? If not, that is the last item on our agenda. Very good. Well, we can be adjourned. And for once, I can say you can actually go outside and it's nice out tonight. So maybe go for a walk. All right. We'll talk to you all and we're adjourned. Bye now.